I'm Rosemary Armbeo, and this is On the Brain. In this chapter, there is no script. I have no idea what's going to happen. I never do when I have these guests on. They are my four sisters. That's right. Five are Mayo girls all at one time. This violates my own policy, which is I never like to deal with more than two of them at a time. But they're all here. We're going to talk about summer vacations which were epic in uh, the Armeos time. They're epic as we've continued with our own families. And it's a message to you because this is going to be the last on the brink for about three weeks. I can't promise that I'll totally stay off the air if Donald Trump, something should happen to him, you know, some sort of court settlement or something. I might have to come on. But basically, we're going to take this summer, take a little bit of time in the summer, uh, to do some traveling, to do some organizing of the um, podcast and um, and the logo and our website, which is still not up. You know that already. And also because you guys are not listening to podcasts right now. Maybe when you're jogging in the morning, but basically you guys turn off. That's what the numbers show. So we're going to take a little break, but this is a treat before we go. You listen to all the emails. And I thought it was fitting um, that we start with a discussion about birth order. This has been getting a lot of attention in the psychology circles. Atlantic Magazine ran an article that I found quite compelling. My sisters may be less so about the plight of eldest daughters. Guess yeah, where I fall in the birth order? Only because you're eldest. Only because you're <laughs> eldest. The rest of us found it was was crap. Bullshit. Wait, yeah, wait, wait you bullshit. guys, you guys, you're already all talking at the same time. I must introduce you because we all do sound the same. And it's going to sound like me doing impersonations. So the first person who yelled bullshit was my sister, Kate. She's the third one. There's five she of us. Said crap. She said crap. I said bullshit. And that would be Lisa, who is number four. And um, they will now tell you why they think. Let me tell you a little bit of the setup of this. Let's well, do the other Thank sisters. You. I'm number two. I'm Joanne. I'm number two. <laughs> I can't be, I'm number five, and I already see this whole thing going downhill. But go I ahead. agree. It's already, it's already, I've lost control. I, I predicted this. <laughs> all right. So this article that I made them all read, because I'm the bossy eldest, says that um, if you are the oldest, there's more responsibility put on you, more jobs. And if you're a girl, if you're a female, then you, you take on, Tons more responsible. You're expected to be the nurturer and the keeper of the family. And it's a huge burden. And boy, I feel it every day. <laughs> oh, well, we don't, we don't really like you. That's, that's how it, that's how and it it's is. mutual. And it is mutual, Sister Kate. It is mutual. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I want to say that seriously, I thought that that would be like crap until recently. But like recently, Rosemary, you have taken on that burden because you are taking care of our elderly mother. So yes, I have to I have to like begrudgingly acknowledge that there is <laughs> credence to that. Well, it, it you know, Kate at one time when I moved back to Albany, which is where our mother lives, and I moved into the family home um and bought it and I settled in Albany even though I really would rather be like in Sarajevo um I all she said just because you bought the house doesn't mean that you're stuck taking care of mom but I always did think that I was I always saw that so there is something to it that it was there but you guys let me point out the four of you took care of dad when he was very sick and dying at the end I was I was overseas then so Joanne, did you organize that? Or Lisa, was that you? You you had a lot to do with this health care at the time. Lisa is a nurse practitioner. Practitioner. Yeah. Yes. Um, I added that. I added that. Um, you know, um, I don't know. When I asked for help, I got it with Dad. Um, and, and, you know, I have to give Dad credit is that when he knew he was becoming a burden, he just fell asleep. He just went to sleep peacefully. It, we yeah. found him with his on the pillow, you know, with in his and okay. with his hands in prayer. I mean, are we, are we making this a hospice care talk? Or are we talking about birth order? Because Rosemary <laughs> made us read this article in New York Times, and I can very succinctly <laughs> tell you my thoughts that. Yes, okay, wait a minute. Eldest, the the eldest eldest thoughts. Sister, this the is the baby of the family talking. The eldest, the these are number one. 
the eldest sibling, no, I don't think there's any that there's more burden on you. Uh, at least maybe growing up, but not that I ever remember you. Rosemary is 10 years older than I am. There's 10 years between the oldest and the youngest. I never remember, I barely remember her in the house taking care of us. So I don't feel that there's anything special about the eldest child. I think the middle child certainly does get screwed up and not the Kate screwed up, but she certainly I did. I totally did. I want you to know that in all of the emails and texts about this podcast, no, I did not answer and no one contacted me. Wait, so wait, I, wait. Could have, I could have just blown you all off because wait, I'm wait. the forgotten sister. I'm the middle <laughs> sister and I no, forgot. No, no. Wait a minute. Who who's Kate? This is Lisa talking now. Who, who is Kate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but, it's, okay. but but it's our family. The ten year difference that kept being talked about, I think, is important. It was almost like there were two families. Correct. There was there was the first three. And then, and then the second two, and Kate, you kind of straddled both of those families. Yeah, no, and, and I, I talk about that. Yeah. Wait, I, one at I, the I time, do. please. I do talk about that, that I feel like I got to do a lot with my older sisters. And then, you know, a lot of the stuff that my family did again with the younger sisters, I got to do again. So I sort of got two childhoods because things that they, you wouldn't have done, like go to the Catskill Game Farm or go to Storytown. You wouldn't have gone when when you older two were older, but we right. went again. So I, I kind of got a lot. I did get extra, but I did. Wait, yeah, get, talk about how mean your older sisters were and how mean you were to your younger sisters. That's the next part. That's, well, Lisa, that's Lisa Armeo, number four. Lisa, number four, has all the grievances in the family. <laughs> oh, uh, bullshit. Okay. Part, part of the article was how family birth order and being in a family, you get assigned certain personalities. Lisa was the pretty one. Uh, Kate, the middle one, was she could do anything. Kind of annoying. The smart one. The smart, the smart one. one, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I, was was the bitch, I was the bitchy one. Still That's are. Joanne. Still true. Still still true. true. <laughs> and Kippy's a friggin' vet. Kippy's a vet. She's not shabby. I'm the I, alcoholic. I know you all yeah. want to say it. Kippy was a drunk. Okay. No, One at a time. One at a time. Or we okay. can't be heard. I, I Joanne wanna, now. I want to get a word in. Uh, birth order has to meant much to me. But now as someone who has grandchildren, I think about that. Because um, when I look at like my oldest grandchild there is something special about the first one and mm -hmm. it's not that she's my favorite or anything like that but and that's why i like and envious of you rosemary because you were the first and well you and you had and it was like that's an experience that like okay if you're a parent and you have like it's new things so like the second it's okay the third it gets old the fourth gets even older but the first it's really really special Okay, and here's the thing. That. Here is the thing, though. We were not really one and two. You were born when I was 11 months old. Yeah. As Aunt Tess used to say to my mother, what would you guys do, stop in the parking lot of the, of the hospital <laughs> driving home? My mother, when I was two months old, was already thinking, oh, God, I have another one coming. I never had time. I, I We were almost like twins, as are Kippy and Lisa. Right. They're right. also the second two. Our mother and birth control, that could be another whole separate uh, separate thing. So I, I don't think I ever did. I, I And... For me, the trauma of being one of five girls is that I was one of a set. I never, I, I, being an individual was really hard, I thought. Do you remember Uncle Mike? We used to play the game, who guess which one we are? Yeah. Do you remember that game? Describe yeah. it, Lisa. Lisa, describe it. Oh, no. well, Uncle Mike would be like, uh, we'd stand in order and he'd get us, and he'd get us in correct order. And then Our we'd names. go- yeah, and then we'd go in the next room and we'd like change like sweaters or like jackets or something and come back out and, and he'd have a hard time recognizing who was who. And for many years uh, it, in Troy, the relatives in Troy, they'd be like, which one are you? And it would be like, oh, I'd be, I'm number four. We, yeah, we didn't yeah. have names. We, it was like thing one and thing two. We didn't have right. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I, and I, I'm okay. always still, wait, wait, that's my, that's my that's podcast, that's I get to talk, my podcast. <laughs> I, I think that that's part of the reason that we were all so competitive, that we have all ended up, I must say, really successful, all of us. So, that, I mean, it's not like we took, well, you did for a while, Lisa, turn into delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm still on the edge of delinquency, but I, but, uh, you know what? I still have my DEA number and I never got the DWI. And, um, I'm just no, I feel like Rosemary, you should like ask, like, I just hope my, I, we should all go through and say this. And my comment is, I think, and in, not in just in our family, but the middle child, I think that's a significant place in birth order youngest child as a youngest child i can say that by the time the youngest one comes along your parents don't care anymore i got to do a lot more stuff than you guys ever got to do oh yeah dad, we're old at that point oh, yeah. and i'm sorry but i would say gender i think at least in our generation would make a bigger difference than um birth order because if any one of us was a boy and in an italian right. family he would have been special. And right. that's it. Right. That's why true. Not everybody, why don't you all comment on that in order? No, no, no. Let me Joanne. make one comment. Is, no. if we're talking this about is, birth. This is Lisa talking. Okay. Between the older family and the younger family, Kate broke all the barriers. Okay. Really? <laughs> she, she did. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. do. I do. <laughs> That you article did. did say that the middle child was the most rebellious. And I wouldn't uh -huh. say you're the most rebellious. I think that's Lisa, but you know, you you stepped oh. over some lines. I I learned from Kate, you know, and she, but no, the difference between me and Kate, well, Kate could get away with it because she was really she was smarter than I was. Because, mm -hmm. you know, that valedictorian <laughs> thing. So Kate could get away with it. Uh, you know, they always suspected me of something, but Kate was really guilty though. Huh? You were usually guilty. I was usually I, guilty. as the oldest. I was I was much older than you guys, and by then yeah. I was I was teaching you about taking you, not just teaching you to get birth control. Uh, yeah, you did tell you. Yeah, talking about all the sex stuff came from us. We Joanne and I. Uh, I talked about this when we came home one day and wanted to know how, I won't say the name, how Larry could have gotten a girl pregnant because they weren't married. So mom took out all the books and sat us down at night. The younger kids were asleep, dad was away. And we got a whole lecture was filled with fallopian tubes and uteruses and sperm. And when it was all over, she said, um, do you have any questions? And Joy and I looked at each other and we said, what does the bed have to do with this, mom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, how many years did you, were you girls in the house and Kippy and I we sat on the toilet next to sanitary napkins and we yes. didn't know what they were. We thought they were cat toys. It was a cat toy. Yeah. yeah. It was like, Mom, what's a sanitary? And it was like, oh, wait till you're older. You know? Yeah. And it's like, what? Because so yeah. when the cats get older, is it, are we going to play with them or what? Yeah. yeah. I, I do remember Kippy saying when I was about, uh, when the, I was a, a older teenager and you were just a little kid. Oh, yeah. I was going to see a movie that was R-rated. I had mom's permission to go because I was the good girl. I always did everything by the rules, which I think is also first, first, first. Born. Oh, cool. So you got married at 18 and you got wire rim glasses and you went and you became a hippie. Okay. So that's bullshit. Oh yeah. Okay. That was oh. my little one act of rebellion. It paled in comparison no, to that's you guys. Three. I wasn't 18. That's three. that's three. I'm calling bullshit on that. Okay. <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, and well, I was going to see an R-rated movie and I had mom's permission to go and Kippy was totally jealous and wanted to go with her. She goes, I know what they do in R-rated movies. They tell you what a sanitary napkin is all about. Because <laughs> we really wanted to know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Joanne, you read the whole article. Do you still think I, 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 you find some significance now when you look at your at your grandchildren? Well, that's the way that I'm 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 looking at it, which is like you know, the first I I understand your point, which is like okay, I was born 11 months later, and as you pointed out, I ruined your life because you, you um, did. Your, yes, um, because then you had to do everything I did. You had to do, and then you went further with it than I did. And 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 well, the latest did. example of that is I wanted a grape arbor. I have one little arch in my in my uh, property, and Joanne buys a new house, and she has a grape orchard. I mean, <laughs> it's like 
it's called like, a vineyard. It's called a vineyard. <laughs> yes, a vineyard. I, I mean, really, this is the gods are messing with me. I'm so <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> All right, I think we should move on to the next topic. Well, we yes. need to take a break and we'll do that right now. Please listen to On The Break on Apple, YouTube, Google, Spotify. Oh, go ahead and think of some other podcast platform that you like. We're there too. You can help us to attract more sponsors and thus more high quality programming by liking us, rating us in general, by engaging with us on social media. Even call us if you want. This will not cost you anything except a few minutes of your time and it will make a difference. Segments of On the Brink can be heard weekly on the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, a feature of WOOC Radio, that's 105.3 FM. This magazine is a volunteer-produced local news hour that airs discussions and debates about topics that affect our world. We are proud to be sponsored by the sales award-winning Donna Frank team of luxury property specialists at Berkshire Hathaway Blake Realtors. Donna is a very old and good friend from my WAMC days, and I can vouch for her skill, energy, and real estate expertise. Check out the Donna Frank team on Facebook, or you can contact her at this email, DonnaFed, D-O-N-A-F-E-D, at gmail.com. You will be happy that you did. not exactly sure where Sam Alito falls in the birth order of his family, but um, he sure has been making a big splash this week by flying flags. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume you have read the story and feel the outrage. I want to hear what you all think about it, uh, starting first with uh, Joanne. I am completely uh, nuts all about this thing. All I can think about is if Sonia Sotomayor or Elena Kagan had had like a rainbow flag when the court was uh, considering gay marriage. MAGA and the rest of the world would have gone nuts and they would have had like a point. They would have been right. And so the fact that this guy does this and uh, feels like no compunction to cover it up and like blames his wife. And it's like the court is has failed as an institution. I have like no uh, confidence in it. Any decision that comes out, like the one that they did um, on South Carolina, today, they have no legitimacy, but yet they're the Supreme Court and they rule the land. And I think that there's only one solution, which is that the Democrats have to win. They have to win big in November. And then they have to like add um, justices to the Supreme Court to like counteract Alito and Clarence Thomas. And shame on John Roberts. Can I just say that? Yes, shame on John yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, okay. I, I least, least. He cannot. He cannot do anything. But what he can do is he can come out and he can say, "This is wrong, Alito. You need to recuse yourself." He can do that. He won't. He won't. Okay. This is, okay. This is Lisa view. talking. Lisa, give your view. Okay. Uh, he he won't recuse himself. Uh, you know what? He's gonna. They're gonna blame the wives. And you know what? Clarence Thomas blamed his wife. Got away with it. Uh, look at look at what he did. The court is so skewed. John Roberts is the only person who can make it right. He needs to speak up and he's not going to. And all the Republicans are going to endorse this. Oh, the wife did it. Right. He, well, it's sort of interesting that Lindsey Graham and other another Republicans have, have come out and like said, like, he should have done that. That's a, mildly encouraging. And I do have to point out that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she also like Eric, I mean, when she spoke out against Trump uh, making comments about like how she couldn't imagine the world, that was wrong. She probably should have recused herself from things and she didn't. Uh, but this is just, uh, it's a horrible situation. And um, 
And, okay, well, I, I, I agree with everything you said, except I reject the notion that only John Roberts can do anything about it. Where is Dick Durbin? Yes, the Republicans are obstructionists, but he is supposed to be reforming the court. He has already said, no, we're not going to investigate. He didn't even call for an investigation. I'm sorry, that's really damn weak. Okay, Very so, okay. Weak. so what's going to happen? You know, I think that, I think he's probably a pr pragmatist at this point. He's figuring out, okay, I'm going to lose on this. So I'm going to win. I'm going to like put like, I'm going to get all the other judges. And the, and the Democrats have had a lot of success in getting other judges, which is good. And let's commend them for it. I just don't know what Dick Durbin can do. Um, yeah, no, Dick Durbin has made a big point that he's had like 200 um, Biden judges now put in. But Trump, uh, another Democrat, was responsible for letting Mitch McConnell put in hundreds of judges. Uh, McConnell held up. Uh, Barack Obama's nominees, and then when Trump gave, came in, yeah. there were hundreds of judges, and uh, our the, the Democrats in Congress did not do anything. They traded away those judgeships because they didn't see what was happening. And the other person that I'm going to blame, or institution that I think is to blame in this in part, is the media. Why are we hearing about this flag? How many years? Yeah. Three? Three Three years? 2021. 20 yeah. Good point. Very good point. And I keep watching. I keep saying there must be some reason and it'll come out. The reporter on the story, Jody Cantor, is a fantastic reporter, Pulitzer Prize winner. She did the Harvey Weinstein Me Too movement stories. She's a great reporter. Why did it take her this long? And well, the other okay, thing, so the, one more thing. Wait, okay, one more. Okay, let me. Rosemary, Rosemary, okay. Jennifer Rubin had an interesting take on that. She's great. Like she's post. great. I heard she, that. she said that the problem is, is that the uh, the reporters who cover the Supreme Court are stenographers. They yeah. are not investigative reporters. And so they just don't, they don't cover the court the way the court should be covered. And so like it took She's someone, right. Jody Cantor outside who, I don't know how, was she like vacationing with one of the neighbors who said something just, we have no idea of like why mm -hmm. this is surfacing at this point. That's my suspicion. But yes, we should have known about this earlier, but would it have made any difference? No, it wouldn't have made any difference. Well, I want to know no, what Kate, the, the forgotten the sister, has to say. Yeah, the Repub Well, I'm I'm amused at the Republicans. Some of the Republicans saying it's like, well, this is a historical flag from the Revolutionary War. <laughs> John um, John Bolton is saying that that uh, how exactly. dare we how dare we impugn a, a Supreme Court justice for flying a historical relic? Oh my God! Okay, the thing that yeah. outward is the uh, uh, a view. Joanne that, speaking. Okay, this was. Uh, Brett Stevens from the New York Times with his conversation with Gail Collins, which is like, oh, yes. well, Mrs. Alito, she has the right to like express her own opinion. And this is somehow like sexist that like we don't want her to be able to express her opinion. And that is such bullshit. bullshit. That is such bullshit. Because, you know, you have a position. And yes, you know, when I worked at the Washington Post, um, my husband... He could not like put signs up in his yard. He could not like uh, right. make political contributions to things. Uh, when I lived with my uh, kids, when we became the compound, I lived with my children. In their general relation, my daughter-in-law couldn't put signs up for her candidates. No, you don't do that. So that is like right. such crap that they say that. I mean, she's married to a Supreme Court justice and she doesn't have the like wherewithal to understand that you don't do that. Yeah, the, the wife has some responsibility, but may I point out that the argument that he wasn't really flying an insurrectionist flag, he was just letting his wife fly a flag in opposition to an anti-Trump sign from neighbors. So he's still happy to live in a house that is openly expressing pro-Trump sentiments. How is that an explanation? How does that make it right? I, I never understood that. No, it's not. It's like he said, I have nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with it. He didn't like walk out to take the garbage out and realize that there's this upside down flag. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just sort of sitting there having nothing to do with him. Does yeah. he think that like we're just idiots? Christine, you know, would you like to say he didn't care for Supreme Court justice and he's untouchable. So no one can do anything to him. That's I it. That. He's completely okay. untouchable. I remember, Joanne, several years ago, we're sitting in a hot tub and you made the very valid point that 
the Supreme Court is extremely political now. So, you know, all yeah. these comments you are making, it's like, okay, but yeah, so it's just, this has been a problem for a long, long time. And it's just like people can get, a, you know, come out, out in the open about it now. You know, in the old days, you know, people were on, you know, they'd get confirmations. It, it wasn't along, it wasn't 50 50 along partisan lines. It was like, you know, what did uh, Ginsburg get? Like 90? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, and and that doesn't happen anymore. You I know? don't know. So I, it, I, I, the whole Supreme a... Court system is, is screwed up and it's okay. supposed to be an independent arm of the government for checks and balances and it's not it's a it's just another political arm of who's ever you know, well the fact have, is so have, have, go ahead john sorry are our institutions failing us clearly the supreme court is failing us failing us the two parties congress mm -hmm. congress is failing us because the republicans are not the check uh, uh that and there's the presidency to do. no yes no. So well, that's like, why Donald Trump's going to come in and do, you know, a, a, you know, autocracy and we'll, you know, then we'll have something new and that's what's going to happen. I agree. I mean, democracy is a, is a dying uh, institution. In my neighborhood, I, I drive around the corner and I see the same Trump sign every day. Although now new in the neighborhood is a Bobby Kennedy sign in the name. Oh, I didn't see that, Lisa. <laughs> oh, right on the end of uh, Linton Avenue. The, oh, it's my like gosh. Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, and it's like, that's a whole, like, that's the interesting part of the political system is like, he's the being- bir good. The birds, by the way, the birds, for those listening, are Lisa's clock. My singing bird clock, yes, it's my singing bird clock. But yeah, Bobby Kennedy, like, you know, he's being paid off by the Republicans to skew well, the camp. I, I am heartened this by the fact, yes, I am heartened by the fact that 25% of Republicans say that if Trump is convicted, they will not vote for him. Oh, with Nikki Haley. But he's not going to be convicted. <laughs> he won't. Yeah. Nikki Haley, Sununu, yeah. Uh, yeah. Bill Barr, they're all, yeah. there are no moderate Republicans left. That is a myth. They're all either Trumpites or they've dropped out of politics. Yeah. None of them still are voting for Biden. It's depressing. However, I do want to bring up AOC. Um, Marjorie oh, Taylor Green and Jasmine oh, Crockett. Okay, I so love that yeah. argument. <laughs> I, I, so you Lisa. know, what, so the woman, what's her name? Jasmine from Jasmine Texas. Jasmine Crockett. 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 Yeah. Okay. So she is like going hard to all of her, uh, you know, to constituents and to any potential contributor about this is what I said about her. Like, you know, like uh, bully bitch body or whatever. Oh, bleach, bleach. Yeah, uh -huh. bleach blonde. Yeah. You have to buy the t-shirt so you can remember it. Bleach <laughs> on bad built butch body. <laughs> and, and I love it. Um, but you know what? I think it, it was a little too catty. And and for AOC <laughs> to go and yeah. for AOC to go, oh come on, baby girl. I mean, yeah. like, yeah, you know what? It, it got too catty. AOC got too catty. sunk to her level. No one took the high road. Agreed. Is, you know, Congress, and they should have just not got sunk themselves to her level. I agree. I agree yeah. about AOC, but I do think that some of the news coverage has has not given the full context, which was our Crockett when she made her comments. It was after they took the vote, and they said that like what Marjorie Taylor Greene said was okay but it was in violation of all of the rules. And she goes, I want a clarification about this. We just took this vote that said that this is okay for her to make a comment on my appearance. So is it okay for I, and then she had this great line. Right. But yeah, I, it think, was. I, think, I think that that was fine. Uh, I do think that AOC with the girl and the baby and that, that was like a little bit too like, yeah. cat fight, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, too, I, I bring up, I bring up girls. I bring up the whole matter because it's further proof to me that our institutions are failing, that we're in trouble. Agreed. Across, across the board, yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to take another break, and we'll be back in a minute to uh, talk about, get a little more personal. Karen's Place is a phenomenal four-bedroom guest house in Bennington, Vermont. It has a private pool, a spa, a fireplace, it's beautiful surroundings. This is the perfect spot to rent if you have a family reunion coming up, a wedding or other special occasion, or for any company events and retreats. 
And if you mention that you heard about Karen's Place from On The Brink, you will get a special discount. Go to naturelogs.com, please, to see the work of our talented sponsors, Denise and Scott Stoner. This husband-wife duo writes and shoots amazing things about nature. They have traveled around the country, and sometimes they just look up in the sky and get these amazing subjects, birds, landscapes, eclipse, bugs. Nature Logs offers photos, prints, and note cards and the Stoners also do slide presentations and lectures. You can find out about them at naturelogs.com, N-A-T-U-R-E-L-O-G-U-E-S.com. Sarah Albright, who took over ownership of the Apple Barn and Bake Shop in Bennington not long, not too long ago, has written this great mission statement for her place that I want you to hear. Okay, okay, I know, I hate the whole idea of a mission statement, and especially I don't see how it applies to some place I go to because of their apple and blueberry pies, I get that. But this is a woman who really is taking seriously the landmark business that she has acquired, and she wants to make something of it. I, I love that. Here's what she wrote. We are continuing a legacy of engaging travelers and the local community alike and strengthening our brand by bridging the divide between education, tourism, and food. We deliver real local Vermont. I love this, and you will too. Please check out theapplebarnalloneword.com. So as I told you at the beginning, we're going to take a summer break. Summer was always a really special time in the Armeo house growing up. And uh, all the sisters here, they, they may remember different things than I do. I'm hearing things in the break that uh, I don't remember at all. Christine, something about our neighbor, Tommy Norton and the beach. Yeah, Cape I, Cod. I remember going to Cape Cod and we took Tommy with us, which... I, I never, he was your guy's age. I never knew how he kind of fit in. He took Joanne to the prom because she couldn't have a date. But I thought <laughs> you and he were always like an item. And somehow. Never, I, never. I remember Kate and Tommy at the beach. Like I said, I don't remember you and okay. Joanne. Okay, here's the situation. Us. Okay, we this never. This is really, Joanne. We never really took big vacations. Never. Um, we, never. We, we, we went to Hampton Beach one year. And my mother loved going to Hampton Beach. And then we didn't do it for a long period of time because my dad worked at the store. And so what we would do for most of the summers is we would do quick trips. We would go to Lake George. We would go to Storytown. We would go to the Catskill Game Farm. I love the Catskill Game Farm. Um, <laughs> That's um, different. Mom, wait, mom used to have to carry a perfumed handkerchief because Joanne... <laughs> So hated the smell of the place and vomited. And that was, that was our vacation spot. We went and watched Joanne vomit at the smell of llamas. Okay, but anyway, so we uh, so we didn't we didn't do like a beach vacation, but at one point my mother wanted to go back to the uh, so I think I think we went back to Hampton Beach. It was not Cape Cod, Christine. So we no, went back to Hampton Cape Cod and, 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 and Tommy Norton came with us. And it was a disaster. We ended up leaving after like five days. I, uh, that's the only thing I remember about it. Joanne, it, I vividly remember it was Cape Cod. We yeah, had it was a, Cape Cod. We had a great time. We were in the dunes. And then like you, the older family had to go somewhere or something. And Tommy was leaving. And Daddy was just like, okay, we're all going home. It was yeah. like, dad, the dad did not like vacations and it was Cape Cod. We went only one time to Hampton Beach. I was nine years old. Yes. I still have the photo of it. I have a huge stomach in it. I hate the photo, but yeah, that's how I remember it. But this is why I have this vast love and desire to travel because we never did as kids. In 1964, so I would have been 14, we went to the World's Fair. Remember, we took a bus down with the nannies. I don't know yeah. how many of you did that. That was the a second family, family did it. Lisa, yeah, second family. Family. I, can, I can remember that vividly because I wore a corduroy suit and I swelled it because it was so goddamn hot. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I, I can carry a corduroy suit. I, I beat that. I wear a wool sweater and a wool skirt. <laughs> oh, no. I, 
where you guys are so, talking about how Danny didn't like to travel, and you're right, we didn't take a lot of vacations. So, like going to Storytown for the day or Gaslight Village was a big thing. Another thing that I remember, and you guys know, I have very few memories of my childhood for whatever reason, is um, the Franklin Market picnic. Did anybody? Oh yes, oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes. Well, Frank, the Franklin Market was my father's butcher butcher shop. And he um, he worked there. He later owned Franklin Market too. But what Christina's talking about was the first one. He was just an employee there. And uh, I remember the VFW clam bake as one of the biggest events of the year because we were allowed to eat clams, which yeah. we never got. And um, one year, Joanne and I were at the clam bar and the, the guy said to my father, you got to get these kids away. And he goes, no, no, I bought an adult ticket for them. They're allowed to eat as much as anybody else. And the guy said, no, no, it's not that they're not allowed. They're going to get sick. And that was that was the highlight, you know, eating and uh, and Storytown. Oh my God! Okay, I have to tell my most vivid memory of our this is our, Lisa of our childhood vacations is that we had the older family and the younger family, and that you know at one point we went to the Scattercoke Fair, and so and yep, then yep. and then and then um, Rosemary and Joanne were already out of the house, and Kate um, Kate was going to college; she was going to Ithaca where I, I had visited her a couple of times, but it was like the two, Kippy and I were like the orphans. It was like the two little kids. <laughs> and and so mom and mommy, who God bless her heart, wanted to convince daddy to do these things. We were going to go to the Scattercoke Fair. Okay, hurry up. <laughs> All right. So you, oh my gosh. No, we had been at the Scattercoke Bear where you guys made us drink buttermilk and we wanted to vomit. Oh, Rosemary so, made us drink buttermilk. Yeah, yeah. I remember so, that. We, so we get, we're in, we're going to the Scattercoke Fair and there's traffic and daddy goes, I'm turning around, we're going home. And Kippy and I were broken hearted. It was like, oh my God, our sisters abandoned us. Our father's an old fart and like, we're just going to go home to the pool that they bought for us, which was kind of cool, but yeah, we were all right. I, I can't hey, believe this is that no, that no one has brought up Brown's Beach. Oh, oh I said Brown, Brown's Beach. I said Brown's Beach. I she, did, she, she mentioned it, but my my God, we went there so often. That was a disgusting place. Uh, you were allowed to smoke that. I love or, Brown's Beach. Uh, I love Brown's oh, Beach. Uh, yuck. It was filled you with seaweed. Brown's Beach. Yes, it was. It's on Saratoga Lake, and it exists now, but it doesn't look at all like it did when we were kids. It was a grassy shore filled with cigarette butts because you could smoke then, <laughs> and a lake that was constantly churning. And it had. Um, it, it still makes me. I'm gagging thinking about it. The seaweed in there. <laughs> yeah, there was lots of seaweed. Yeah, yeah, lukewarm water and seaweed. And the reason we went is because it was very near the track, and Dad oh. and Uncle Oscar would go to the track in the afternoon. We were we were. The beach was there for us during the day. Well, hey, do you but, remember, but do you remember Uncle Tone had a boat at, at one period? Okay, of time. okay, Kate brought up uh, Brown's Beach. I think she wanted to say something about Brown's Beach before you guys interrupted her. Oh, no, just that it was, you know, we, we would go there. It was a beach. Yeah, there were dead fish in the lake. But, you know, you got to see uh, the weed. Uh, at the pool. This was before we had the pool. Yeah. And and um the tilt the world. It had a tilt the world. Yeah, they had rides. They had rides. Yeah. Somebody got electrocuted there one year. Wasn't us. Great. Not on the not on the tilt the world. It was on one of those little horsey things that got on there. Yeah, it was one of the rides. My most vivid memory about Brown's Beach was um that Every time that we tried to go, it would always rain. We would do these picnics and we would do it with our cousins, the nannies. And there was one day and it was like we woke up and it was like, the, it was beautiful. It was a great day. We're getting ready. We're packing up the food. And then the phone rings and it's my Aunt Rose saying that like Teresa like poured like coffee all over herself and she has oh, third degree. Yeah. And uh, she couldn't go. And I'm like, okay, well, Teresa can't go. Why can't we go? Oh Teresa and Ruth, I mean, I, just, I have no sympathy for my cousin. She has third degree burns. And I just went as far as I wanted to go to Brown's Beach because it was sunny that day. And we didn't go. So okay, like, so Joy. a lot. Go ahead. Joy, oh, so go ahead, Sheik. Family. You guys are all you guys are all talking at the same time. Zach is gonna have to just cut this all out one at a time. Right. Who wants to talk? 
me. I was going to say Joanne was always Thanks. the compassionate one of the family. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say back to Lisa's thing about the how we you know couldn't go to the Scatter Coke Fair because Daddy couldn't sit in in the um, traffic. Yeah. I still to this day have never been to Saratoga Battlefield. Do you remember that? Oh yes, yes. When the car broke no, down. I, I was car, in, yeah, I remember that. And Daddy was all huffy, and we had to go home. I, I want to move this into the future now because a lot of those patterns of the past still have repercussions. I mean, it's for me, it's like I go as far away as possible. Mongolia is about as far as Pakistan, uh, because that's as much further away than Lake George. But um, the pool is still the same. Johnny Weissmiller pool is still in the backyard. And I spend half of my summer scooping out leaves and uh, cleaning the pool. That's still a big part of my summer vacation. And so are the picnics. Do you remember we would go to picnics at the nannies every yes. week? I was yes. so sick of hamburgers and hot dogs and, and adults talking at the picnic table. So we still do picnics like that. Uh, but for me, I, I, it's always that when I hit... Cairo, which is on the throughway, and it's um, where the Casco Game Farm used to be. Um, I I feel like, oh, wow, I'm almost home. And for dad, going, driving to the Casco Game Farm, you would think we were driving to Mongolia. Absolutely. He had the car service. Oh, okay. he, got, he, got, he got different routes. How could you get there from the days before the throughway? Different routes how to get there and what time to leave. And do you remember that? So in, in many ways, um, summer to me reminds me of like, um, the weird childhood we had. Um, I think the most exciting summer summer coming up for us this year is probably Joanne. Yes, we're having my daughter is getting married. Um, uh, yeah. She's 45. She has a three year old son. He's been living with this guy like forever. But we're having the wedding of the century like yeah. she's like the virgin prince die. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and we're all very excited about yes, it. Yes, yes. The royal wedding. Uh, and it's costing extraordinary amounts of money. But yeah, I love having parties. As my mother once said, if you don't want to have, if you don't want to spend money, then don't have a party. Although uh, <laughs> something hit home to me um, uh, the other day, which is that my sister Rosemary has been cleaning out my mother's house. And she like uh, has been giving me so periods of time, like bags of papers and pictures and stuff like that and a couple of weekends ago i'm like going through these papers and i come across a bill uh from the italian benevolent society <laughs> hall which is where i got married we all got married there pretty much yeah and the bill was for our wedding and it was 845 dollars <laughs> which my order pointed out is what her shoes for her wedding is costing us $845. But it's going to be fun. Um, it's going to be crazy. I'm already stressing about the seating charts, who I'm putting with where. Um, um, uh, so when the Secret Service is involved, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to, you know, d determine that. It's the sister Lisa who will be officiating at the royal wedding. I'm the head priestess. Um, the head priestess, yes. <laughs> okay, so we have to do a toast. We have to do, we end, we always end the show with a toast. Okay. And, and okay. Um, so get your glasses. Yes, I know you're all ready. Okay, and yeah. um, this is something I, I, I have done this for, I, I remember doing it at my son's wedding, with, which you were all there. The last time we had a wedding uh, that we were all together. And so I, I was saying again. Yes, yeah. yes, you are the officiant there too, Lisa. Uh, are you available? Because this goes to many people. Maybe they'll hire you. Uh, but I want to make a toast to my sisters. They make me crazy. I can't deal with them all at one time. But they are a very high standard to live up to. They're smart and funny. And um, thank you so much for being on the show. Bye, oh, guys. Goodness. That's a you going to cry? Mary you going to cry? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary, and it's all true. <laughs> <laughs>